Welcome back. Joining me for a 2024 macro and Bitcoin outlook, the one and only Lynn Alden. Lynn, thanks so much for joining me. It's nice to see you. Happy to be back. Nice to see you too. Well, I just watched uh, Peter's interview with you, so I'm going to try to make things a little bit different. Where I want to start is just looking back over 2023, one thing that I love about your work is your forecasts are just so spot on. And I wanted to see if you could share what was on your 2023 bingo card that panned out and what wasn't that maybe you were surprised by. I, I think one reason why forecasts work out pretty well is because I try not to be... T- we have to be aware of how much we don't know. So by not committing to like really specific forecasts, by understanding what what is the direction that's likely to happen. When you try to have direction and magnitude and timing, it's just like it, no one's going to get things right. And it's almost like bad information is worse than just not admitting you don't know certain information. Um, so that's the first step I try to do with forecasts is keep them kind of light because there's just so much we don't know. There's more variables than we could possibly digest. Um, you know, for, for me, the big transition point was realizing that, um, you know, I've been, I've been pounding the table on the idea of fiscal dominance since 2020. Um, and to some extent back in 2019, I kind of pointed out that this was an option that they could pull. And once we actually started to see it pull in 2020, 2021, I kind of point out that this is not like 2008. This is not just QE. This is, this is very forceful types of fiscal stimulus that is, that is supported by QE, which is quite different. Um, yeah, and in 2022, my my theme was basically okay. Now that now that they're going to start tightening, um, you know, we're we're looking towards economic slowing. We're looking towards inverted yield curve. We're looking towards you know potential recession. Um, and for much of the year, that was playing out. We got you know we got all those those classic um, uh, things happen. But then one thing that kind of surprised me, and I started to kind of shift, and it, it kind of points to the need for flexibility. Um, so you know. By the fact that homeowners and large corporations have so much low uh, rate debt uh, fixed and long term made them more resilient than I expected. And just the, the aggressiveness of the Fed um, ironically blew out the deficit even more than I expected, which ironically is somewhat stimulatory. Um, and so one thing I started to notice by around December and January, kind of the end of 2022 going into 2023, was that the fiscal was actually starting to take over versus that pure monetary tightening to some extent. And so I had to pivot my view to be less bearish than I was throughout much of 2022. Uh, and so that, you know, for example, if I said in 2022, I'd be surprised if they're able to get rates over 3%. And that was something I was wrong on because I underestimated how quickly that feeds into, say, federal deficits um, that then pour out into the economy, ironically, and combined, especially because so many homeowners and corporations have locked in their debt so that the, the shorter duration debt from the government actually gets impacted earlier. Uh, and so that that's something that I had to adjust as it started to play out. And by not being kind of like dogmatically fixed on a view, it allowed me that as it started to play out a couple months into this, I'm like, okay, no, there's actually like a trend change happening here. Um, Another kind of estimate I had was that, you know, Bitcoin would be higher than it, you know, started the year, but not all time highs for the year, uh, which I think is healthy. Basically, you wouldn't want to see Bitcoin keep making lower lows after it already fell so much. That'd be not a great sign. On the other hand, I didn't really have much optimism. It was just going to, you know, blow out. So, so, but again, that's, that's like a very kind of low key forecast. It's not hard for that forecast to be accurate. It's basically saying that, okay, I think we're seeing some signs of stabilization, but that I, you know, I wouldn't expect a complete blowout. And, it, you know, it had a really good year on a percent basis, but it still ended up in that range of it's, it's firmly out of the depths of its bear market. Um, in, in Bitcoin land, we kind of view it as like another bull market just because of how strong it was and, and how much the energy changed. But if you kind of zoom out to like macro world, Bitcoin is still barely on radars because it hasn't broken all-time highs yet. Uh, so it's still in that kind of, you know, intermediate zone. Uh, so, for, yeah, but overall for me, the biggest kind of interesting thing was watching this dynamic between fiscal and monetary and how the shifts of power, um, you know, just kind of changes by, by quarter by quarter. Right. So as they turned down sort of one spigot, they turned up the other. So it, it counteracted. Yeah. Um, one thing that I guess I'm confused about is I've heard you and other analysts 
um, mentioned that global liquidity is really up and Bitcoin has been correlated to liquidity. So we're seeing liquidity increase, but yet all of these economies, China's, Europe's, ours are nearing potentially recession and decelerating factors. How can both be true? So liquidity often happens in the face of weakness. Uh, and so liquidity uh, is not necessarily correlated with the economy. It often precedes it. Okay. Um, and so, for example, the some of the most liquid you get is, for example, in in you know the early parts of 2020, we got mm -hmm. some of the biggest ever liquidity injections. But that was before well, the economy was still on its knees. Um, and so that's actually sometimes where you get a divergence between, say, a purely liquidity driven asset and a more economy driven asset. So if you look at a lot of if you if you look at equities, for example, outside of like the best you know, seven performing U.S. stocks, right? So all those big tech titans, many of them are expensive. But if you look at, say, um, U.S. value stocks, more cyclical stocks, that, you know, they've been kind of weak over the past year uh, in line with a kind of a somewhat weaker economy, kind of a, you know, where we have below 50 purchasing managers index for manufacturing. We have very negative uh, readings on the conference board leading indicators, right? So a lot of economic things are soft. And then as you pointed out, China is very soft. Europe's very soft. Um, and so there is a lot of economic weakness uh, throughout the world. But that's partially why there's been an uptick in global liquidity, that, that basically a number of authorities have found it necessary to add liquidity back into the market, despite still having struggles with inflation. Um, and so that's one factor. And that's where you potentially get a divergence between, you know, stocks that are more tied to the economy itself can still do kind of lackluster. Whereas, uh, you know, if this was if this was a different era, we probably would see gold a lot higher right now um, because gold is, you know, it's 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 more of that liquidity driven. Uh, like a debasement type of protection. It's not necessarily tied to the economy. And then now we're seeing obviously Bitcoin um, in, in a lot of that role, which is that Bitcoin is, it doesn't have earnings. It doesn't have to worry about unemployment. It's mainly about um, is there enough liquidity to flow into it or are people kind of forced sellers uh, in, a, in a liquidity crisis? Uh, and as long as liquidity is decent, Bitcoin historically tends to be pretty decent and it, it's divorced from the, the uh, performance of the economy. Um, and so I think that's, that's kind of what we're seeing now. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners who make this podcast possible. Coin Stories is brought to you by BitDeer, where the power of Bitcoin mining is at your fingertips. As a publicly traded leader, BitDeer's global reach and scale means they're everywhere you need them to be, ensuring you're part of the thriving Bitcoin economy. BitDeer's not just mining, they are industry pioneers, and BitDeer stands alone as the only vertically integrated, technology-focused Bitcoin mining company. What does that mean? Well, they're not just deploying, but developing the latest tech to make Bitcoin mining more efficient and effective. With the industry's most experienced leadership team, innovation is in their DNA, and it shows with a quarter of their workforce dedicated to research and development, pushing the boundaries of what's possible in Bitcoin mining. And now they're leveraging years of expertise in data center and cloud management into high-performance computing through a recently announced partnership with NVIDIA. Join BitDeer in reshaping the world of Bitcoin mining. Learn more at bitdeer.com and explore how they are pioneering the future today. How would you describe why the economy was able to withstand these aggressive rate hikes as quickly as they happened when back in, I believe it was 2018 at the end of the year, when they just slightly tried to increase rates and Trump, I think, had a hissy fit about Jerome Powell because all of a sudden the reverse repo went into shock mode. I mean, how how were we able to raise this much and not trigger some sort of massive crisis or hard landing? Well, so that's that that's why it surprised me initially, um, and I had to kind of in real time take into that account the information that's happening and see what's happening with the models. The main answer I would say is that the fiscal was larger, uh, and so if if you look at the first three quarters of 2022. That's when you had the full force of the tightening. So the, the rates were going up, the balance sheet was going down um, at the Federal Reserve, and the Treasury and the fiscal side was not really offsetting it at all. So it was just, you know, assets across the board were down, everything was down, uh, the economy was decelerating uh, by, by almost all metrics. Um, and but starting in that kind of fourth quarter of the year, uh, that's when you started to get the Treasury offsetting the Fed. So first they began dumping their Treasury general account cash back into the market, uh, which is pro-liquidity, 
uh, and they continued doing that all the way up through May of this year, of last year, 2023. Uh, and then the second lever they pulled was to start issuing more short duration bonds than long duration bonds. And that allowed them to pull capital out of the reverse repo facility and push that back into the market. And so the, the Treasury's done two different types of actions that have more than offset the Fed's liquidity drain. Uh, and so that's been beneficial for both U.S. markets and to some extent global markets because it took the edge off the dollar index. And as you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of global debt denominated in dollars. Mm -hmm. And so when the dollar strengthens relative to other currencies, a lot of those companies get squeezed. You don't want your income to be in the weak currency and your debts to be in the strong currency. Um, but ever since that exact moment, that, that fourth quarter of last year, we saw the dollar index kind of come off its highs, mm -hmm. which then gave the, the globe kind of a, a, some breathing room. Uh, so that was a big factor. And then two, the interest rates were interesting because you know that, that's, that was surprising. I would say one is that there's just so much liquidity in the system, so much extra cash still in there um, that it kind of gives a lot of buffer to get through it. And two, it's the fact that, you know, the the kind of the middle class, and upper middle class homeowners have a lot of that debt just fixed rate, mortgage, mortgage debt kind of fixed rate. Investment grade corporations, again, a lot of that's low fixed rate. So, so very little of that is actually impacted um, these entities. Mostly it's felt in small businesses, which use shorter duration bank loans normally, um, non-investment grade corporations, uh, so drunk rated corporations that generally have shorter duration debt, um, you know, people that rely on credit cards. So, you know, working class and, and, and kind of lower working class, they're more impacted, unfortunately, by, by some of these policies. And then ironically, the federal government itself has, has pretty short duration debt, on average, something like six years. Um, but a lot of that's, you know, a lot of that's like front loaded in the first year or two, and then they have a long tail that goes out to 30 years. Um, and so they're actual centers in that first few years. So they start, they start exploding out interest expense. And what, what a lot of people don't realize is that that interest expense, you know, all this, all these deficits on the federal side are someone else's surplus. Um, so they're, you know, they could be flowing into offshore investors that own the treasury debt. They, they're flowing into onshore investors that have money markets, that have T-bill exposure, um, kind of, you know, any sort of mid-duration bond or lower is, is doing pretty well. Um, there's been a, a re-increase in the wealth effect from equity prices, and real estate prices kind of bouncing back uh, on a nationwide average. Um, and so that was kind of a big factor for how we were able to get through that. And you know, again, the challenge was, you know, if you asked a lot of people in early 2022, including me, you know, can they raise to 5% and it not, you know, kind of blow things up? We would have said, oh, probably not. Um, but I think the key is that you you respond to information early when it starts to happen. You say, okay, what is what is happening that I didn't necessarily predict? And what is the sequence of events playing out? And so it was, it was important to be to kind of move with that as, as it happened. It's kind of, you know, I keep pointing to the 1940s as the closest analog. Right. Um, and, and that while that has been incredibly useful, it doesn't mean it's, you know, it's going to play out step by step, note by note like that. So you have to have, I find that having that historical analog, but then, you know, month after month, quarter after quarter, updating what's actually happening um, is, is kind of that blend that's, it's hard to do, but it's, it's something that we, we all have to do. Yeah, no, it's it's really important to be fluid. I think that's why a lot of people trust your newsletter because you you certainly are. You respond to to the data points that come out. One thing I was hoping you could clarify is when you say that the treasury is dumping into the market, what does that mean? What what are they purchasing, and and what are the fiscal deficits being spent on? So basically, there's there's pools of dead capital out there, and and the two big ones are the treasury general account and reverse repos. So the treasury general account is the treasury issues bonds uh, and collects taxes and money goes into their, they basically have, they have a checking account at the Fed. It's the treasury general account. It's their, their working capital, their cash balance. Uh, and then, you know, they're always spending on various, you know, the, the entirety of the government. Um, and so there's like that, that float that they have there at all time. And, and that's capital that, you know, if they, if they issue a ton of bonds or have a big tax season and they, they suck a lot of money in, but then they're slow to spend that back in, they basically have sucked more money out of the economy than they put back in. Mm. Uh, and so while that capital is in there, it's, it's dead capital. It's been removed from the system, uh, but it hasn't been recirculated back into the system yet. And so the bigger okay. that is, all else being equal, 
um, that is like it, it's it's the bigger that is, the more negative it is for liquidity because that's that's removed capital. And the inverse is true. If they were to if they draw that down, it just shoves all that capital back in. They're spending money back into the economy that they're not taxing and they're not raising bonds to pull in because they've already pulled that in. Uh, and so while that's being put in, it, it's pro liquidity. And normally they try to keep a pretty static balance, you know, several hundred billion dollars uh, in that at all times. And of course they've raised it as all, all the numbers get bigger. The deficits get bigger, the nominal GDP gets bigger, everything gets bigger. So their target gets bigger, but they try to have a pretty uh, fine target. But what really kind of put that into overdrive was the debt ceiling. So mm -hmm. one of the things that they do in response to a debt ceiling, they're told by Congress, okay, you've, you've hit the debt ceiling. You can't issue more bonds, but you still have your bills to pay. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you're a homeowner or, you know, any sort of household and you, you know, you've lost your income, but you still have your cash savings. You have, you have no choice but to start spending your cash savings on your bills. And that's what the treasury does. They just, they just kept spending without raising more. And that, while that happens, it pushes all that money into the economy. So that's number one. Is, is just dead dead money coming back in. Got and two, it. the reverse repo is not identical to that, but it's similar. Um, basically, um, the, back when the Fed was doing QE, they did so much so aggressively that they actually did even more than, than they needed to. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was actually a lot of excess cash that would have preferred to be in T-bills. Um, because it's, it's safer than a bank. It's, you know, T-bills are, are, you know, you're backed up by the federal government rather than a private institution with, you know, a quarter million in FDIC insurance. Um, and so T-bills are, are very desired. Um, and the, what the Fed didn't want was all that extra capital pushing T-bill yields below their target rate. Um, there'd be ironically excess demand for T-bills. They don't want that. So they said, okay, instead of pushing T-bills, everybody fighting over T-bills and, and, and kind of interfering with our ability to, to be hawkish, they opened this other facility and said, mm -hmm. you can put cash into here and you actually borrow T-bills and your, your rate, the rate is set slightly above their lower bound. And so it's kind of like this extra void of money that wants to be in T-bills um, but can't be yet because it's not enough T-bills and it doesn't really want to be in banks either. And so as the treasury issued a ton of T-bills, um, they were able to soak up money from this facility and then spend it into the economy, which mm. again, this, this void is kind of like dead capital. It's just excess cash that just you know wants to be in T-bills. They actually put it into T-bills and then spend it back out. So again, they're able to, you know, they're, they're raising um, income, but that income is not coming out of bank reserves. It's not coming out of household savings. It's coming out of reverse repos, which are already this this void. So it actually brings it back into the system, which is pro liquidity. And so that's why that the two phases one was first with the TGA, and then the second was the reverse repo facility. And together they were they were enough to to roughly offset the the Federal Reserve's quantitative tightening. So bank reserves right now are higher than they were at the beginning of 2023 um, because th these net effects have been slightly bigger than the Fed's tightening. Got it. Okay. That is super helpful. Thank you. You know, one thing that's surprising is just the fact that fiscal deficits are are going up so much when we're out of the pandemic and we no longer have all of those programs. We don't have the CARES Act in play anymore, the PPE, the ERC credit expired. So you would think that on the fiscal side, actually spending would be going down and it should be, um, but instead they are pumping that side where they continue to sort of restrict the the monetary stimulus. Am I getting that right? Yeah, and and part of why I was, you know, not expecting them to be able to raise rates more than three percent is because the amount that that blows out the fiscal deficit is kind of unfathomable, and yet they did it anyway. And and the the effects are. At first, it feels good because deficits feel good on the economy while it's happening. But then more and more people yeah. are kind of looking at this debt and deficit situation and and realizing that it's increasingly kind of unsustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that has been, you know, kind of a huge factor. And yeah. and so one another thing is that what one of the key things that got me into macro, you know, I used to be more focused on equity investing. Uh, and, you know, back in 2016, 2017, I wanted to start focusing more on macro. And it was because we had an unusual divergence between the deficit and the economy. 
So if you look back in modern history, normally, um, you know, the deficit is smaller during a, a strong economy and it's weaker during a recession. Mm-hmm. Um, but we started to get this divergence in 2016, 2017, where the deficit was actually getting worse mm-hmm. uh, while the economy was still strengthening. Yeah. Um, and the reason was uh, a couple of reasons, but a key one was the the baby boomers were kind of reaching their peak retirement years. Mm-hmm. And so the demographics of the nation were structurally changing for the worse deficit wise. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that that was a key variable that happened. Uh, then it was amplified by the fact that we had tax cuts that were not funded mm-hmm. by spending cuts. Um, and so that just that added to the deficit. Then, of course, COVID blew it out. And then even when even after that, now what we're getting is the interest expense is is mm-hmm. blowing it out. In addition to that demographic headwind still being there. Uh, and so a stat that I point to is that, you know, for decades, the Social Security Fund was increasing. So more money was going into it than was coming out. But, you know, starting a couple of years ago, that began rolling over. Uh, and it'll take a while to drain all up until kind of the mid 2030s. But basically, it's, it's the, the whole demographic situation has shifted. And so that leads to the structurally higher deficits because these programs were not really balance with that in mind when they were kind of, you know, originally set decades ago and and there's been not not significant modification since then. When you compare what's happening right now with our deficits, but also how um, assets like equities are performing, how does that compare with 1970s and then the 1940s that you always talk about, which were also structurally high in in inflation, but very different, obviously? So it's very different than the 70s because in, in the 70s, you had very high uh, interest rates um, and you had low federal debt. So higher interest rates were just purely bad for um, kind of investors right now. So what makes the 70s and the 40s so different and why I point to the 40s more than the 70s is the 40s had high public debt to GDP mm-hmm, and the 70s the had, yeah, because of the war. And the 70s had low public debt to GDP, near, like the lowest in modern history. Um, especially by the end of it. Um, and so, you know, there's a difference when you have 120% debt to GDP versus 30% debt to GDP. And mm-hmm. the, the main difference is when the Federal Reserve increases interest rates, it has two main effects. One is it it does make it harder for the private sector to borrow. It slows down credit formation generally, um, which which should, should all, all else being equal, be disinflationary and potentially recessionary. Um, but on the other hand, it also increases federal interest expense. Uh, and in the 70s, uh, the, the former was a larger factor because the, the federal debt was low, private sector lending was high. So raising interest rates had a more immediate effect on slowing down the economy. Um, whereas in the, in the 40s, because you had so much public debt to GDP, uh, if you were to raise rates, you'd have a fiscal spiral. So back then, they didn't even try to raise rates. The, they, the Treasury just completely captured the Fed, did yield curve control, mm. and um, they didn't do that. So right now, we've been in this hybrid situation where yeah. they have tried to be more hawkish than the 40s. Um, but unlike the 70s, the problem is when you're hawkish and you have that very high public debt to GDP ratio, the fiscal side just has a spiral. Just, it, it keeps yeah. pouring out larger and larger deficits into the economy, which offsets some of the tightening that the Fed's doing in the banking sector. Um, so to answer your question, equities did, uh, did not perform very well in the 70s. Uh, they did not perform very well in the 40s. Um, the 70s was because just, you know, the, the interest expense was so high, uh, commodities were so high, so a lot of margins were pressured. Uh, and so it just, it was not a very good time to invest. It was obviously towards the end of that period, if you started to invest then, you did very well because then you enjoyed the 80s and the 90s and so forth. The 40s were different because in theory, it should have been a good investing environment because you have high inflation, but low interest rates. Uh, so you, you should want to be in equities, but that was kind of overshadowed by the fact that there was a gigantic war happening. And so the markets kind of bottomed around the, the battle midway. Uh, so there is basically this this extra component of how's the war going, which is a different question than how's the economy doing. Um, and so uh, it was very low equity valuations, great time to start investing, but it was not exactly a, a, a powerful year, a powerful decade for investors. But one thing is that um, real estate prices did really well in the 40s. They kind of had this like big spike in nominal prices. Uh, in response to so much stimulus that was happening. Investors were barred from owning gold. Uh, I think a lot of them were concerned about stocks. Mm -hmm. Um, Real estate did really well. 
and it kind of had this huge almost like bubble looking spike but then it just kind of stayed there and it kind of eventually flattened out and just kind of stayed at that level for for several years it was like a stepwise permanent increase because there's more money in the system mm. and houses kind of just had this one time step up in in prices in aggregate yeah you mentioned the uh fixed mortgage rates earlier i was actually hoping that home prices would come down cuz i would i would love to be able to to buy in the near future but yeah, I mean, those analysts that kept saying that we're going to have another 2008, it's just not happening. Um, and there seemed to be sort of a consensus that we would have this hard landing and it didn't really pan out. So what do you think about that? And what is your outlook for 2024? Yeah, it's, it's not a it's not a very kind of interesting forecast. But the thing I've been sticking to for like 18 months now is that house prices in aggregate were probably going to be somewhat sideways. Uh, which is what we've seen. I mean, they had a kind of a weak 2022, but not a crash, just kind of they softened. And then they had a rebound in 2023. So house prices in aggregate are going sideways. Um, obviously, there are certain hot markets that are cooling off. Um, and there are certain linear markets that are up. Uh, but nationwide average is range bound. Um, uh, and equity so far are the same way where they had, you know, they had a decline in 2022. It wasn't catastrophic. Uh, they rebounded, uh, you know, kind of around all time highs, um, but still down in inflation adjusted terms or compared to T-bills, for example. Uh, and I think that's that's probably a story going forward is, you know, equity prices and house prices are high, but then they're supported by so much, you know, just ongoing fiscal spiraling that's happening. Um, and so one thing we can learn from the seventies is that, you know, the, the performance of the stock market on its surface didn't look that bad, but when you inflation adjusted it, it looked terrible. Mm. Um, and, and so I think that that could be a story over the next decade, which is stocks in, on average, don't do particularly well in inflation adjusted terms and house prices in general, probably don't do well in inflation adjusted terms because they're mm -hmm. already rather richly valued compared to incomes or you know, for stocks compared to their earnings uh, on average, um, but that the sheer amount of nominal GDP growth, kind of background fiscal driven types of things that are happening, uh, it, it makes me not really expect a 2008 style kind of big disinflationary deleveraging. Um, and, and so now again, I would, I would update that if I started to see it, mm -hmm. um, but it's just not something I'm seeing right now that basically a lot of investors, they always want to fight the last battle. They, they think of 2008 and they're always worried about another 2008. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think that the crisis is more in the currency and the bond market uh, mm -hmm. rather than equities or yeah. real estate or things like that. Now, of course, there are pockets. You know, Commercial real estate is still a mess uh, in, in many ways. Yeah. And the so kind of mid-sized banks and local banks, they have a lot of exposure to that commercial real estate that the big banks don't have. And so there, there certainly are pockets of danger out there. Uh, but basically, it's uh, it's kind of like if you look at an emerging market in a recession, a lot of the prices that you'd think would be down are not down because the currency is also down. And, and so they're down in dollar terms or they're down in gold terms, but they're not down in local currency terms. And I think what we're going through now is kind of a mild version of that, except in, in developed markets where the currency themselves is, is part of the bubble that's that's not doing well. And so owning the kind of the scarcest assets is, is kind of one of the few ways out of that. Mm -hmm. Well, when I read about um, the amount of losses that we've already have because of the, the banking shakeout, as well as um, some of the bankruptcies that we've had, I, f I think the numbers are actually higher than in the 0809 great financial crisis, but we did blow up the bubble so much bigger that I'm just thinking of this, you know, massive water balloon. And if you poke it, water's definitely pouring out, but this is a totally different size balloon than we had in 0809. So there's still room to go. Um, what is your outlook on inflation? And do you agree with people like Luke Groman and I believe Felix Zuloff who think that inflation is going to be potentially double digits this time next year? I don't know about this time next year. That's a that's a pretty aggressive call, uh, double digit inflation this time next year. Um, so I I would probably take the under on that. Um, I am looking to see. So my my case for a while is that uh, the 2020s on average be more inflationary than the 2010s, um, and but that it wouldn't be a straight line. 
So, uh, you know, we got the initial inflation spike. I started talking about disinflation. We started to see, you know, monetary tightening, um, you know, kind of harder base effects when you're, when you're measuring things year over year. Um, and so that's played out. I think a key question going forward is there's a couple ones to watch. One is what does energy do, right? Mm -hmm. Because w whether or not we have, have price inflation at double digits a year or two from now, there's very kind of flow chart Boolean outcomes. Like d does Iran's oil come off the market or not, right? That's because yeah. that's if you if you list things how you can get to double digit inflation. So right now I'm saying I would take the under, but where would I be wrong on that? It's if we have some sort of major energy crisis, uh, for example, and that's that's more of a geopolitical question than a predictable economic question. So uh, it, it's making sure you know the variables that could lead to certain outcomes. So I do expect in the 2020s that we will have more energy scares and more periods of kind of frighteningly high oil or gasoline prices, or in some cases, natural gas. Uh, I don't necessarily know what's going to happen in the next 12 months. Um, there's, there's certainly variables that can make that happen. Um, I, you know, I, I've been trying to kind of stick to a two year time frame, uh, kind of 2024 and 2025, because I do expect within that two year view, we're probably going to have another liquidity cycle. We're probably going to have another rising, uh, economic acceleration within that two-year period. Uh, and so if we do get that, I would expect inflation to come back with that. Uh, but again, I don't know if it would be double digits because that would partially depend on what's happening with energy shortages. Wow. Um, and another key factor to watch is, so we talked about liquidity mm -hmm. and the offsets that's been happening. So there's still about a trillion in reverse repos mm -hmm. that can be pushed back into the market. A question is, what happens after that? Does the Fed start going back to kind of gradual balance sheet expansion? Um, and that could be a turbulent period when you're potentially doing a handoff from the Treasury's liquidity drain to, to the Fed uh, mm -hmm. because they might not want to jump in right away um, if they're still you know, trying to get inflation back down to their official targets the way they measure it. Um, and so... I think we could have pockets of turbulence, but I do expect over the next two years probably to see that another liquidity cycle, another economic reacceleration cycle, um, and you know inflation to come with it. And the question is, does that start in mid 2024? Uh, has it already started? Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that we're still monitoring because liquidity suggests it has probably restarted, uh, but we're not really seeing that in the economic data yet. Uh, and so I still am kind of worried about the for, you know kind of the call it first six months or so of 2024. We'll see how that, that plays out. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, Bitcoin 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin conference is coming to Nashville this year. Come join us for three amazing days of keynotes, panels, networking events, and my Women of Bitcoin brunch. The Bitcoin conference is where I launched my podcast almost three years ago. You never know what can happen or who you can meet here. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off. Next up, CoinKite, which makes everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin, including the cold card wallet. This is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes and get a 5% discount with promo code COINSTORIES. Next up, crowd health. Health insurance costs are sky high, and it's money that feels wasted if you don't need a doctor. By crowdfunding healthcare with other Bitcoiners, I get to avoid traditional insurance fees and support real people instead of mega corporations. Crowd health also works to reduce your medical bills, so the community's contributions cover more. Imagine spending just $100 a month on healthcare and investing the rest in Bitcoin. If you're interested, visit joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. All right, back to the show. Got it. Okay. Well, let's pivot a little bit to Bitcoin. I'm kind of worried that there's such a consensus that we're going to have this massive bull run. It's definitely going to six figures. A lot of people thought that last time around. So can you give me a couple of the paths that can happen? I mean, what, what would initiate this uh, bull market with the spot Bitcoin ETFs help, I'm assuming? And what if we're wrong? What, what's the scenario where maybe, maybe it doesn't do that and it faces more headwinds? Yeah, it's a good set of questions. So um, I expect, I don't see any signs that Bitcoin is not going to continue to be correlated with liquidity. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges, everyone's kind of focused on the halving and things like that. And of course, that all matters. So the ETFs matter, the halving matters. Um, the halving doesn't necessarily matter 
in the several months around the halving. You know, Bitcoin's ongoing hardening is really important. But if you look at prior bull runs, um, there's a lot of variability around the halving. And I would say in large part, that's because it's actually liquidity that affected the timing more than just the halving. The halving helps set up higher highs and higher lows because it's, you know, how much Bitcoin's coming to the market that has to be absorbed, especially in a bear market, uh, mm -hmm. really matters. But the actual timing of, you know, three, three months, six months, 12 months uh, is, in my opinion, far more liquidity driven. So um, I, I think the ETFs are going to be helpful. Um, you know, people are debating whether or not they're a sell the news event. Like, you know, a lot of people priced in the ETFs and is, mm -hmm. is the first quarter underwhelming. It's certainly possible, um, you know, that, that money doesn't just pour in as quickly as people think. One thing I would take the under on is people keep saying, well, what if, you know, uh, you know, these tens of trillions of dollars of pools of capital have a 5% allocation? for example, or 3% allocation. And it's like, that's not going to happen anytime soon, most likely. You know, one one kind of um, uh, description I've given is that it's been known for a while that if you have a gold slice in your otherwise 60-40 stock bond portfolio, it improves your risk-adjusted returns because there are periods of time where both stocks and bonds don't do well, but gold does well. So for example, the 2000s decade or the 1970s decade, um, there are decades where just that that slice helps a lot. And yet it's a, it's still under allocated compared to what you'd expect from looking at those numbers. Mm -hmm. Now, Bitcoin is like a rocket fuel version. I mean, if you look yeah. at that, you know, uh, you know, Nakamoto portfolio or other types of resources that show what is adding a small slice of Bitcoin to your portfolio do? And it's like astounding for risk yeah. adjusted returns. So it should, you know, you'd think it would catch on quicker. But some traditional pools of capital just take a long time to make investment decisions. Generally, when someone, you know, a small business where the owner just has majority stake, they can make very swift decisions. Um, there's some publicly traded companies that are still a lot of the decisions still held by by the founder. For example, MicroStrategy, they're mm -hmm. able to make quicker, more dis decisive type of decisions because they have that capability. Uh, whereas, you know. Firms that have a lot more spread out decision making, um, it can be a very long time to actually meaningfully adjust a portfolio strategy. So I do think that the ETFs are going to be helpful, maybe less so than people expect right away, but I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I think the other thing that, that could potentially derail it is a liquidity problem in 2024 or a, a stagnation in liquidity. It doesn't have to be a liquidity crisis, but it could be that you know you have just a, another stagnant liquidity situation so you have like 6 months of choppy liquidity choppy bitcoin and it kind of lets out some of that consensus steam and then then maybe you run in 2025 right yeah. so i i'm not trying to predict any of those scenarios like literally if if you if we look back at the end of the year if bitcoin has dipped into like you know the upper 30s or if it's over if it's already six figures neither of those scenarios would surprise me because it's such a volatile asset and there's so much marginal difference that can happen. But that's why instead I've been far more comfortable making two-year outlooks, which is that I really don't know what's going to happen in 2024, but at least I feel like I have a higher conviction of what's going to happen with the combination of 2024, 2025. So you, you absolutely could have a case where all these people are super bold up for 2024 and maybe what they expect to happen doesn't it gets all shifted back six to 12 months, for example. Um, I, I think there's a lot of scenarios like that. So far, we've not really seen any sign of distribution. So, you know, when Bitcoin goes through, you know, kind of major bull runs, normally some of those um, older holders start to sell into that market strength. You know, maybe they want to rebalance. Maybe they want to consume. You know, now that now they can finally afford the house they wanted that they couldn't afford before. And so you see some of that distribution as new buyers come in, and that that process hasn't even started yet, uh, based on any sort of on-chain analysis you look at. So I say, I still think we're very early in this structural bull run, but I do think it's important not to take a bull run for granted. It's not necessarily like owed to you uh, just because the halving's happening. Uh, or just because it's it's on that cycle. Now, I think it, it's probably still likely over the next two years, but it's, it is important to kind of manage your expectations and risk uh, accordingly. Am I crazy that I don't want the six-figure Bitcoin yet? I want to be able to stack more and I'm just, I'm not ready. I mean, I love the sound of it. I know it's going to happen eventually, but can we slow down a little bit? I'd love, you know, some low 30s Bitcoin if that's still ever possible. <laughs> yeah. Um I wanted to ask you about 
fighting for the the freedom aspect of Bitcoin, the right to self-custody. And even when we talk about the spot Bitcoin ETFs, I feel like it's a tale of two teams within the Bitcoin community. Some people are really excited about them because they see it as the industry maturing and more adoption, number go up. But on the other side of it, there are concerns that these institutions are trying to, you know, get all the Bitcoin into their into their hands? And does is there a risk that potentially the government would say, well, you can no longer self-custody. You have to have it at a, at a custodian that we um, approve. Do you see those risks? And what do you want the community to know about the importance of protecting the right to self-custody and building tools so that you know Bitcoin remains a, a freedom technology and that we also build tools to um, protect the decentralization and, and make sure that Bitcoin mining does not get into fewer and fewer hands? Yeah, it's a good question. I, so I want to point out that the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust already has like half a million Bitcoin. Um, and and so some of the concentration of custody risks that could happen from ETFs, I would say have largely already been in place to some extent. Now, the majority of Bitcoin are not held uh, like that. Um, they're, they're more distributed, which is a good thing. Um, but there are some of these big pools um, that, that could be kind of either price issues or confiscation issues at some point. And that's not something that's gonna, gonna form, that's something that's already there. Um, they're already the, kind of these big pools that are te technically capturable. Um, another thing I would say is that there's a degree of inevitability to it, which is to say that any large and liquid asset is likely to get an ETF for it and is likely to get banks wanting to hold it uh, either for themselves or for their customers. So. To the extent that Bitcoin was successful, it was always going to face this at one point. It's not like something that, that can't not be faced. So the question is, uh, you know, is Bitcoin itself designed in such a way that it's ready for it? I, I think it is, uh, but that's still another test it has to go through. You know, it had to get through like the block size war. It had to get through some early bugs in the network. It had to get through. There are some countries that banned it and then like flip flopped on the ban. Um, you know, and, and there's challenges along the way. And I think this is another challenge that's going to materialize. Um, so institutional liquidity has both a pro and a con. One is the con is the obvious one, which is you don't really want a lot of Bitcoin in ETFs or in highly regulated silos that are capturable. That, that's, the, that's the downside. The upside is that more liquidity and more kind of automatic rebalancing of large pools of capital can help reduce the volatility to some extent, which then can make it a better... Uh, money for people that are using it non-custodially, especially mm. in developing countries. Right. Uh, because the, the, if you ask people, why don't you use Bitcoin? You, the number one is usually volatility. You, they don't understand it and it's volatile. Uh, and so to the extent that it becomes larger and more liquid and more kind of widely held, uh, that can actually then then encourage more of those small self-custodial type of, of buyers to enter. So I think that's, that's number one. Um, you know, the other one, I think the biggest challenge is kind of that privacy aspect yeah. where in order, the government doesn't mind if you have Bitcoin as long as it's in a, it's in a silo. Uh, the second one is, okay, you can custody it, but they want to know you custody it and how much. Yeah. And then the third one is they really don't want private Bitcoin self extolly to move around because that threatens their income tax model that threatens their control over kind of sanctions that 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 kind of goes against the core of the current system so they really don't want that and i think that's kind of the the bigger the bigger fight that's going to be had this decade is is basically that that you know price might be doing well um but that it's not really kind of changing things as much as you think because it, it's held back by some of those frictions um the good news there is that um so far it's been very hard to enforce that, right? So for example, you know, Nigeria cut off Bitcoin from its banking system and uh, they remained having one of the highest adoption rates in the world. And specifically, uh, according to chain analysis, had the highest peer-to-peer -peer trading volume in the world because that's, that's how they got around the, the bank blockage. And then we just saw uh, in recent weeks, Nigeria's central bank is like reversing their decision to some extent. Uh, they're basically realizing that, 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 that their blanket ban is not working and then instead they want to try to bring it back in and regulate it a little bit, which is basically a way of saying we, we, we kind of messed up. We also saw India flip flop on this. Uh, we might be seeing in the process of Argentina, uh, you know, because they, they had 
you know, done the similar thing where they, they didn't make it illegal to own, but they said, okay, banks can't, uh, you know, get into involved in the space as much as they want. Even uh, fintech companies that are not banks still can't get into it. So they did this kind of series of restrictions to try to slow the outflow from the peso. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's obviously probably going to be somewhat different under the current administration. Uh, and so we've seen a number of countries kind of bounce around on trying to do that, which is actually bullish because it shows how hard it is to do. In the United States, I do think that there's going to be a lot of pushback on privacy, a lot of pushback to maybe a lesser extent on self-custody. Mm-hmm. And that's where those legal challenges become important because, you know, kind of the, the strength and weakness uh, of countries like the U.S., they have rule of law. And so it's not just they can just decide something and it just happens. Uh, we've seen, for example, the SEC keeps losing court cases, uh, which is which is you know, including, you know, kind of um, blocking a spot Bitcoin ETF for longer than they normally would be able to do. Um, But court cases have challenged that. And so to the extent that the U.S. government tries to outlaw, you know, open source, non-custodial privacy techniques or tries to outlaw self-custody, they open themselves to a plethora of lawsuits um, that are pretty hard to defend against because basically saying it's, it's illegal to, you know, keep a large number hidden, for example. Uh, that's, you know, it, it kind of touches on that first amendment stuff. What if you design a privacy solution and you write it in a book and there, and all the codes in a book, which is basically what, what, um, Phil yeah. Zimmerman did in yeah. the nineties, you know, he, yeah. the government said, well, you can't, you can't export that encryption, that open source encryption you made because we consider it a type of, of weapon. And he said, well, I'll put the code in a book. And so that's, you know, now you have a constitutional court case to, to deal with. Um, and so I think you could see similar types of battles in Bitcoin. Um, but I, I think, unfortunately, that is going to be an ongoing, not just next year, but just mm-hmm. ongoing multi-year friction about, to you know, making life kind of hard for American Bitcoiners or just Bitcoiners that, 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 that kind of these types of governments can in some way interact with to basically say, OK, it's, you know, you have all these extra reporting requirements or um, you're getting inquiry into this reason or just kind of frictions that I think uh, somewhat will be resolved by court cases, but it's it's not not quick. Yeah, I was talking about this with Jan Pritzker in a recent episode about his book, Inventing Bitcoin and Mining. And we touched on privacy and this this concern that what's unique about the Bitcoin technology is if you know what you're looking for, you can see that, hey, the transaction that was just spent is attached to a wallet that has, you know, five thousand dollars or a million dollars and that's a real concern and and you know if the geopolitical and the social polarization issues around us continue to escalate there could be a concern for you know someone's well-being um if they have a lot of bitcoin and they they don't want people to know about it but what else what The other thing that's interesting is with other assets like real estate. I mean, you go through a ton of paperwork. Every the government knows how much you know your house is worth. Everyone pretty much could look it up on Zillow. You're taxed on it every year with property taxes, um, with you know shares of a stock. Everything again, the government knows how much you have. And with the fact that Bitcoin is this asset that you can self custody, it's not like physical gold. You can't send it lightning speed to another country over the internet. This is something where you could potentially take all of your wealth and transfer it somewhere. And so they want they want control and they want monitoring over that. Is that like kind of the, the crux of the issue? We should be able to protect what is ours so that no one knows exactly how much money we have. But at the same time, they're going to want to regulate it the way they do with all these major asset classes. Yeah, I think you hit the head on the nail. Um, uh, that's exactly what they want. Is they they anything that kind of threatens their existing model, they want to yeah. pull it back into that model. Uh, another thing is that what's complicated is that in the current era, the entire taxation structure is predicated on extensive surveillance, right? Because um, you know, going back to older times, um, it's easier to kind of say, okay, this is your, this is like. Uh, imports and exports right so we can we can put excise taxes on those or you know this is your establishment or this is your large property and so we're going to tax that but keeping track of millions of people's incomes and taxing them on that income is only really possible in the current banking era where everybody's income is pretty transparent yeah. to the government mm-hmm. um and so 
if you have a situation where people can, you know, there's more gig economy work, so people can just send money more peer to peer. Uh, and then two, if there's privacy techniques to, to, you know, rightfully make that hard to track, like you said, it's not just, it's not just privacy from the government, it's privacy from corporations that, you know, in the modern era want to collect as much information as they can on you. Uh, so it's a, it's a natural right that people have. They don't want Facebook to know their net worth. They don't yeah. want Google to know their net worth. They don't want to, they don't want Google to have the list of everything you bought in the past year, when you bought it, who you bought it from, and what your net worth net worth is. That's creepy, right? And and it can be yeah. used against you. And they can be hacked, and it can be brought into the dark web, and then yeah. you know. And so there's many reasons why you don't want that to be public. Uh, and the government uh, is just one of the many reasons. Uh, especially if you live in a more authoritarian regime where you don't really necessarily want that to be public. Um, I, I think partially we're going to see kind of a shift in over time how people use Bitcoin, which is, you know, lightning is more private than on-chain transactions. We also see emerging technologies like Fetty Mints, for example, Chalming Mints more broadly, uh, whether they're federated or not. Basically, Chalming Mints are inherently private uh custodial upgrades uh mm -hmm. in, in, and so I, I think you could have a case where a lot of payment volume especially if people are more privacy aware are using these just just more private techniques uh and they should be fully legal they should be allowed because privacy is not illegal doing illegal things is legal like yeah. you know funding right. a terrorist group is illegal right but one thing we see in the modern era legally is that they say, okay, just, just the act of moving money privately is something they try to crack down on. And mm -hmm. I think that's where there needs to be a separation of just, just moving money privately is not illegal. Right. It just, it, it's just you, you protecting your own interest from all sorts of different kind of private prying eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, do, I think, yeah, I think we'll see more changes to how people use Bitcoin over time because there is a response function. As they realize they're surveilled more, or as certain things have frictions, they can gravitate towards new technologies that are making that kind of easier to um, get around. And I think that's that's the optimistic view is that you know it's not just government surveilling things. It's, it's it, that if you self custody money, it's expensive for the government to come and confiscate it. If you have all your gold in the bank, right? And there's a handful of banks that have all the gold. All they have to do is go to those banks and say, okay, it's our gold now. Um, yeah. whereas if the gold's in everybody's house, um, they're going to have trouble going door to door and getting that gold. That's why even, even during the 40 year gold ban in the U S which they were only able to do because they had the most concentrated political power ever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, super majority in Congress, uh, even then there were very few prosecutions or enforcements about it because there was no realistic way to, to do it. So some mm -hmm. people just hodled for four decades, passed it to their kids and just got through that period. Um, and so it's, it's, it's expensive to enforce. And I think the privacy is going to be a similar thing, which is that if, if it's open source and it's out there, um, the onus is on the one trying to prevent it. Um, and that's, that's uh, landmines of legal challenges. That's landmines of how do you even enforce that? Um, and I think a, a key thing is like podcasts like yours that are, you know, highlighting the, the practical use cases and reasons, basically trying to demystify the idea of privacy uh, and say, just because you're mm -hmm. private doesn't necessarily mean you're doing bad things. It just means that you don't want Google or Facebook yeah. or authoritarian country XYZ for monitoring uh, everything you're doing uh, financially or information wise. Exactly. Yeah. It's going to be fascinating how this plays out. And I was going to say, well, we should just get a bunch of Bitcoiners in office, including the White House. But even if we did, I feel like they would still take these steps to try to crack down and um, oversee as much as possible. And I read actually something really interesting that I believe Lee Bratcher put out from the Texas Blockchain Council. He talked about the difference between the internet and Bitcoin with regards to the internet being information, which is non-rivalrous, but money is rivalrous. And so if you take it away from one spot, um, you you know, that's a loss for that entity, the government, the banks. And so since you have that rival risk component, they're going to they're going to fight it more and they're going to want to oversee a lot more. The Internet doesn't have that that concern. Um, all right. It's time to wrap up. I just want to get your final thoughts. What do you want to leave people with? I know they're going to be following your work, your phenomenal newsletter. I have the link in the show notes for everyone who wants to check it out. Best money you'll you'll spend. Um, you'll feel a lot smarter, too, which I do whenever I listen to Lynn or read her work um, and also your book, Broken Money. But outside of that, final thoughts for 2024. 
I think the final thought is that every person can do something that um, is helpful, right? So, you know, we talked about how there's probably going to be frictions uh, in the years ahead around privacy, around self-custody, uh, and little things like writing to your local politician or, um, you know, it, just, just kind of sharing with people around you, not even just not even just trying to, like, get them to buy Bitcoin or something like that, but just talking about, you know, privacy or talking about uh, rights and things like that. I think that, you know, those it's like death by a thousand paper cuts, except it's it's optimism by a thousand paper cuts. It's basically that that, you know, what what prevents what prevents some of the most draconian or negative outcomes from happening is little by little pushback along the way uh, in kind of a grassroots way. Um, and that's, that's, you know, right now we have a lot of political polarization, which has many bad aspects to it, but the good aspect that is really hard for the government to do really, really kind of draconian things as well. It's like the, 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 the comparison I make is that, you know, when they ban gold, uh, they had a supermajority in Congress. They they could literally pack the Supreme Court if they wanted to. They could do almost anything. Uh, whereas today we have kind of the opposite situation, which gives some cover for people that are just trying to live their lives and build technology and be private and not hurt anyone else. Um, and but every every person can do something small to add to the legal challenges of coming after people or. Uh, to change the Overton window, the public discussion around these types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then even little things like, for example, um, you know, if there's if there's core developers being attacked, uh, you can do things like contribute to their legal defense uh, in some small way. You know, someone can send the quote of $25 or $100, uh, which, which might not mean a lot to you. But if a thousand people do it, um, they're able to kind of de defend themselves. And so yeah. I think that helping others uh, and doing whether it's monetarily, whether it's just with your time, whether it's some small little interactions, um, there's millions, millions of people that can all do, you know, small, medium or large things that, that really add up if everyone does them. That's such a great point. And with more people getting into Bitcoin, including the institutions, with number go up, that will hopefully mean more economic empowerment so that people can fight for what they want to see. They can fight for the laws, they can elect the type of people they want, or they could just move to another country that maybe has more favorable rules yeah. if they don't like what's happening here. So Lynn, always such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Congratulations on the success of Broken Money. Sitting right there, most amazing read of last year. I recommend everyone get it. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of the Coin Stories podcast brought to you by BitDeer. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any new content. This show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. My inbox is open if you want to share feedback or guest suggestions. You can reach me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. I'll see you next time.